Hey guys, happy Halloween. There's Daisy. Daisy, come here, come be famous. Come be famous. Daisy, Daisy, come here, obedient dog. It's not even close to Halloween. Halloween is still over a month and a half away, but uh, you know, the world has been getting me down a little, just a little. And Halloween cheers me up. So, especially because Halloween is not gonna look like it has in years past due to COVID, I decided to go ahead and decorate a little early. Last night, we got a random lightning storm. So I broke out the Halloween decorations and I watched a scary movie and I decorated my living room just a little bit. I don't have that many decorations because I've lived in, the, in an apartment for the last couple of years. Most of my Halloween decorations are either from, there's a few that I got on clearance. A lot of them have been given to me by friends. Most of them, are from the dollar store. I either just buy them and put them up as is. What I usually do is upcycle them a little bit and kind of, you know, zhuzh them up a little. For example, this pumpkin. I got this at the dollar store. It was painted all white. It was like a cream white and it had lines drawn down each of the the lumps on the pineapple but they weren't even straight lines and like it was just they were really this was it was not cute so i took it home and you know put a couple coats of paint on it and now it's my little beetlejuice pumpkin just some acrylic paint you know and a little bit of time and you can really make something super cool i have two ravens that i got at the dollar store i have two of them because in north myth mythology because in north Wow, why is that so hard to say? I have two ravens because in Norse mythology, Odin has two ravens that represent memory and thought. So I also have the, the names of each written in Norse. I'm not gonna try to say it because I have no idea and I'll look like a big dumb. But one thing I would like to do with these guys is paint over top of them to make them look more like an actual crow or a raven. But today's project, when I start to decorate, I always crave layers and different heights. It makes it more interesting. If I ever get something and it comes in a small box or a black box, I'll always save it so that I can use it to create a level. Last night, I was decorating and wanted to create some levels and went out to the shed and grabbed a couple pieces of scrap wood, stacked them up on top of each other. I had this great idea. I decided that I wanted to paint these blocks of wood so that they looked like books, specifically so that they look like spell books that are mentioned in Harry Potter. As many of you know, I am a huge Harry Potter fan, a very proud Gryffindor, and I'm actually a Gryffindor. People always ask me like, oh, are you just a Gryffindor because Harry is a Gryffindor? And that makes me want to punch them in the face, which is a very Gryffindor response. So I'm a big Harry Potter fan, but I don't have a lot of Harry Potter memorabilia and decorations because I find a lot of it to be a little corny. It's just all like not really taken seriously. I have a couple of pieces from the Pottery Barn Harry Potter collection and they are gorgeous, and it is the Harry Potter merchandise that I have craved my whole life. It actually looks magical. It doesn't look like it's made out of plastic or some mass-produced souvenir. So this is a really cool way that I figured I could incorporate my love of HP into my Halloween decorations. And also, that way it makes my Halloween decorations look more organic. So I'm really excited about it. I really like making things out of scraps, things that would usually be thrown away, things that cost you little to nothing. I believe that the best thing that you can do for a creative mind 
is give it limitations. It will force them to think outside the box. Artists can very easily just float off into the clouds, but if you, if you give yourself some confines, you will be amazed what your mind will come up with. So I like to make things out of just shit you got lying around, which is this. These are scraps from some project that we did. I don't even know. They're all relatively the same size. They're great for stacking. You can kind of make them look interesting. I'm going to paint them so that these are the, the spines of the books and stacked over, over on the shelf with the candelabra on top or maybe my raccoon skull. I don't know. But either way, this is what's going to be future books. This will be the first of several decorating projects that I would like to share with you guys of stuff that you can make with scraps around your house. Of course, the flip side is that I don't throw anything away because it could always be something. It's kind of a problem. So the first thing that I'm gonna do is just do a rough sanding on these and get them to be easier to work with. So these definitely do not need to be perfect. I'm not even getting out my sander. I'm just using some sandpaper from the dollar store. This is, I like the finer grit. This is a 120. However, I don't know if you can tell, but this sandpaper is very used. I have blocks somewhere, but I can't find them. To be fair, I only looked for about 10 seconds, but uh, you know, they didn't show up, so I've moved on. It's a, it's an ebb and flow of life then. Oh look, this one, this one even has a little chunk taken out of it. It doesn't matter, it's going in the back. Nobody will know. And if you really wanted to, I mean, use everything, you could just get some wood putty and fill that in. If you're even crazier than I am. And if you are, there's nothing wrong with that. I commend you and your insanity. I was doing this outside, but although it's Halloween in my heart, it is not even close to October weather outside. So very, very warm. I actually really love sanding. It's one of my favorite parts of the whole process. It's just so satisfying. I do have to be like reined in when it comes to sanding on big projects because I will spend a lot of time making sure that it's perfect. I don't really apologize for that because all of my projects are super smooth. They don't go super smoothly. They just wind up very smooth, purely in the physical sense. Okay, I am actually gonna go look for those blocks again because they will make this so much easier. Win a win a chicken dinner. Imagine that I actually looked for something and I found it. <laughs> anyway, back to sanding. just so we don't get splinters. That is all we are trying to do. Fix little edges like that. Make them not like that. Oh, I love all the sawdust that I'm getting all over my living room and kitchen. Yes, choices. We made them. Ah. I broke off a piece of the wood. Oops. And now we go ahead and pick up all this sawdust. I'm gonna put it in my compost bucket. Just from doing like minor sanding. Now we have to figure out what I'm gonna paint on the books. So here I have my handy dandy Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. I think this is my second copy. I think my copy of the first one and the third one both fell apart. I know the third one fell apart. My binding just gave up after countless rereads. I stopped counting how many times I reread it when I hit 20 times. I love these books. Look at this cool bookmark that I was using. Where did that come from? I don't know. That's really cool. Okay, anyway, sorry. Major awesome discovery. Thank you, Magical Harry Potter book. Okay, so let's see. The list of books is either going to be in chapter four, The Keeper of the Keys, because that's when Hagrid shows up on the island, or chapter five, Diagon Alley, when they are 
shopping. Oh, I get opened right to it. Nope, never mind. Just kidding. <laughs> like this page. When I get to this page, I will hold here and I'll pull on it. I catch myself doing it all the time. And I probably was reading in the bathtub, had wet fingers and probably ripped out a chunk of my book. Sometimes. Ah. Okay, here they are. They were in chapter five, Diagon Alley. We're probably gonna do 1,000 Magical Herbs and Fungi, A Beginner's Guide to Transfiguration, A History of Magic, Magical Drafts and Potions, maybe? And the Standard Book of Spells? You know, I know myself, and I'm gonna wind up just going and cutting three more so I can have all of them. Yeah. But for right now, we'll start with these five. Oh, it just smells so good. So we will begin by putting a base layer on these guys. I want these books to look like classic books, not modern, even though if you think about it, Harry Potter takes place, what, in the early, in like the mid 80s? I went to school in the late 90s. Our textbooks had like all kinds of crazy pictures on the front. I kind of like imagining an 80s Harry Potter. Maybe the, the wizarding world was not taken in by trends. I can't imagine a world in which David Bowie is not magical. So I'm pretty sure that there would have been some, uh, some major Bowie fans at Hogwarts. When you're painting, I recommend using some sort of palette that you can reuse again and again. This is an old Olive Garden menu from when I worked there as a server and I had to learn the menu. Shortly after I started, we got a new menu and these are all gonna get thrown out, so I grabbed one and I've been using it as my palette ever since. I also paint on it so I don't get paint everywhere because I have a slob. I have some really cheap acrylic paint. I think it came, it's like from Michael's. It came in a kit with like, you know, 12 paints for like $8 or something. So you don't have to have the best quality stuff. Just get what you can and do it because if you wait, then you're never gonna do it. This is not all my paintbrushes. Where are the rest of my paintbrushes? Why don't I ever know where anything is? Where are you, my little paintbrushes? Where are you hiding? Where are you hiding, little brushes? can't find anything. Well, that's annoying. These are all my fine tip brushes. Not any of my big, fat, let's get the job done brushes. Dang it. All right, guess it's time to follow my own advice and use these tiny brushes, which is annoying. But that's what we're gonna do. So this one had some Sharpie on it, but even the cheapo paint covered it pretty easily. You might want to prime your wood first. I don't know, this seems to be really sucking up the paint. I'm not really concerned because I bought this paint when I was flat broke and I have been gradually replacing it with slightly higher quality acrylic paint. I really love the brand Folk Art. I think it covers really nicely. We have a lot of different color options. And remember, you're only gonna paint the side that is gonna be your binding the same color because the other sides are pages. That's number one. I need to get a little water cup to rinse my brushes. Since I only have like 10 brushes I get to work with. Ugh. Oh, wait. I found them! I totally forgot. I was thinking that I still had them in a cup, but I forgot that I put them in this old chocolate box. There's my brushes. Thank goodness. Oak took forever. 
Here we go. There's the ticket. Okay, so I got a brown book. I'm going to do a burgundy book. And remember, this is just the base coat. So like, I'm gonna paint this book burgundy and then I'm going to probably layer some brown and black and stuff over top of it, make it look really cool. I don't want it to be this red, but I'm just putting on a base coat right now. All about layering. Oh, this paint goes on so much thicker. It is a different brand. Slightly little bit more expensive. But it's literally a difference of paying like 89 cents versus a dollar 29 cents. A dollar twenty nine cents. The herbology book will definitely be green. I have a little old Edgar Allan Poe book. Actually, it's about this size. Got it at a flea market, and it is this color green. I forget which story it is. It's it's one of it's just one story found in this tiny little old book. Is it copyright infringement? If I sing it like I'm a cat? Cool, 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 cool. I still have a lot of red sitting here on my palette that I didn't use and I don't want it to go to waste. So I'm gonna mix it with the brown. I'll do a brownish reddish book. And then I'll do the last one in black. Key. And I still have a bunch of paint left over, which defeated my original appointment. All right, last one, we're gonna do black. Do the shake it weight, shake it weight, it's a shake it weight. It's a piece of equipment that was really weird, but a lot of people bought it anyway. Ugh. This looks like the tar in Fern Gully. than credited. So I definitely want this to be a darker brown. And I have a little bit of black left over, so before that dries, I'm actually gonna go ahead and try to fix this color a little bit. I'm not super happy with it. Yeah, I like that much better. Ah, oh, shit. Dang it. This is the hazard of mixing your own colors. Damn, I just ruined it. No, it's just a really dark brown. That's okay. That's what I wanted. But now this color, I can't have two reds. Let's try a light brown. Nope, I don't like this color at all. For my pages, I have this folk art linen, which is kind of like a bone color. It's a little darker than bone. I'm gonna go ahead and add the color for the pages. This is the easiest and fastest way to paint faux pages. First, put down your base coat. While it's still wet, grab a dry brush and streak on some of the blackish brown. Be careful not to over blend it and voila, perfect pages. Oh, and make sure you clean off your dry brush frequently so that the paint doesn't dry on it and you ruin the brush. Speaking from experience, unfortunately, all right guys, so it is almost 11 o'clock at night and I just finished what I wanted to get done for the night. So what I ended up doing was I went through and I pulled for Daisy. The loudest and longest drinker in the world. Well, that was a short one. So painted the pages onto the books, and then I also painted the edge of what would be the cover to give this more of a 3D realistic look, and I think it looks great. I also, uh oh, I also painted the one brown book, Navy, and I'm really happy with how they look. So there's my colors. Tomorrow, I'm gonna distress them, and then I'm gonna put the spines on. I wish my back didn't hurt. I would like to keep going, mostly because I'm having such a good hair day. I am gonna call it a night and I will see you lovely humans on the morrow. Or in video world, I'll see you in three, two. Hi.
Hi guys, welcome to day two of our little book craft. Now that all of the prep work is finally done, we actually get to be creative. I always find that that's the hardest part about creating something is that when you're in the mood to create and you wanna start a new project, that's when you have to do all the tedious stuff like laying out a pattern or painting primer or all that stuff. And I used to always rush through all of that, but it, it pays to just buckle down and do the prep work when you need to. I did, yay me. And now we actually get to be creative. I have my, my little mock-ups that I've drawn for these guys. I might actually relocate my setup to go sit on the couch because this is going to be a long process. And I think I'm gonna put on a scary movie while I paint or start a Harry Potter marathon. Because what goes better with everything than Harry Potter? Nothing, it's the best. And if you can keep track of that double negative, good on you. Actually, I totally lied to you. I like went and got my camera set up and then remembered that I still have to distress these guys. So first we're gonna distress them, let them dry, then start the Harry Potter marathon on the couch. Yes, 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 yes. Does this frame look super crooked? I think my tripod's broken. Oh my. Do the waitressing trick. Just stick a little piece of paper underneath and then it'll sit straight. And look at that, works every time. Painting time. I've hydrated my sponge. It's like doubled in size and now it's nice and soft and the texture is gonna be a lot easier to work with. I like how I said all of that while I was off camera. I also really like these pieces of hair that keep just falling in my face. Okay, finally get to paint. So we're gonna mix up a little bit of red, a little bit of brown. So I added like, just like a deep of black. Made it a lot better. Yeah, and now I'm just kind of at random, especially around the corners, but you wanna get it everywhere. We're gonna do another layer, so fear not. And you can do as many layers as you want. And you can soften it with the side of your sponge that doesn't have any paint on it, you can use that to blend and then go back in while it's still wet. And now I'm just going in with like some of the straight up brown. Yeah, it looks good, I'm happy with that. My brown, since I repainted it like six times, already kind of looks distressed, but I'm actually gonna hit it with some of the same reddish brown that I just used. Nope, I don't like that at all. <laughs> We're gonna hit it with some black. Yeah, and this is with acrylic paint, especially if you're just doing kind of like a, a quick layer, you, you need to work fast because it dries really fast. And for a distressed look, blending is key. And having your sponge wet definitely helps. So mostly black on this one. Warm it up with a little bit of this brown. Don't be afraid. You know, I did not have the pleasure of growing up watching Bob Ross but now that I'm an adult and I've discovered him, it's been hugely inspiring to me. He is not afraid to make a mistake. And I feel like we spend so much time afraid of messing up, afraid of saying the wrong thing. At least I do. And it's really freeing to just make something and give yourself permission for it to like not be perfect because nothing is. You can make anything into an, an exercise in acceptance. You really can. And then I'm just going in with some of the straight up, the light brown for some highlights. Yeah, this is looking really good. Looks like a pirate book or something. Some of those highlights are just a little much. So I'm going back in with the naked side of the sponge, which at this point, the whole thing is kind of crummy, but that's okay, because that's the palette of this book, so it doesn't really matter. Hell yeah, that looks great. And remember that the spine is actually gonna be the part that they're seeing. I'm like spending all this time on the front and back cover, but like it's not gonna be visible with how I'm using these. Friendly reminder to myself to uh, stay on task, you know? I am totally obsessed with how these look. I feel like they turned out so good. They're kind of stuck together. Whoops. They just they look beautiful and they really look like books. 
just like super give myself a pat on the back. <laughs> Love it. So this project ended up being a little bit more complicated than I originally thought that it would, which is definitely a theme in my crafting. To help yourself out, you're going to want to use a variety of tools. I found myself working with toothpicks, fine tip brushes, and mechanical pencils that I just dipped the lead into paint and then wrote with that. The pencils and the toothpicks especially worked really, really well on the lettering while the brushes lend themselves more to any sort of curves like certain letters or any of the swoops and swirls that I wound up doing on this book. If you really want to make it easier on yourself, just use wood that's a little thicker. This wood was really, really thin, but since I was specifically trying to use only scraps, this is what I had to work with. If you're making this project, I would recommend getting something just a little thicker. Before you jump into the lettering, if you've never done really intricate lettering like this, you definitely want to practice. Grab yourself a piece of scrap wood and just practice doing some of the more difficult letters like R's and G's. S's can be surprisingly difficult. This will also help you out because it will give you a better idea of which tools you want to use for which parts of the job. It's also really important that you figure out where center is, both by measuring the physical distance and by counting your letters. When you count the letters, make sure you also count a space as a letter. In addition to measuring for center, I would recommend measuring out key points on your design. You can either divide it up by quarters or even more than that by like sixteenths or something crazy. What I like to do is find points that naturally break up the design, measure out the distance to those, paint those on first or mark them out, and then work from there. That way, nothing on the finished piece is out of scale. Take your time and be patient. You're gonna wanna put down at least two coats on all of the lettering so that it's vibrant and it looks printed, not painted. It can be really frustrating when you're working in such a small scale, but it's also really rewarding when it's done, so don't give up. Another tip on the lettering, think vertical as opposed to horizontal. Try not to think of the phrase that you're painting as a phrase. Instead, think of it as a collection of all of the shapes of the individual letters. If you can divorce your mind from the idea of the phrase and just work on shapes, it is so much easier. Trust me. It frees you up to work from every angle. You can flip your book upside down, work on the side, whatever you gotta do to make those tiny, tiny letters fit. And finally, you're gonna wanna keep your brush wet. I rinse and reload my brush after two or three brush strokes. It prevents the paint from gumming up on the brush and just makes it easier to work with. Hold oh, there. This is a good angle because you get the one Halloween bat and all my booze. <laughs> booze! <laughs> okay, anyway, so I've completed two books. I did one more complicated one and then one that's just straight lettering. The nice thing about this project is since you're designing it yourself, it can be as complicated or as not complicated as you want. If you're like me, you have no control over the amount of complicated that happens and uh, you go for crazy designs like this gold one. It's just in our nature. Hashtag Aquarius thing. You can make these on a larger scale. I am doing this because I like to torture myself and also because this was just the scrap that I had laying around. But I'm still really happy with them. You can go back and touch up some of the detail spots with some darker paint, you're not gonna be able to tell. Like I went in and did a line between the A and the G there because it just kind of ran together. So you can do that with a Sharpie, you can do it with paint, you can do whatever you need to do to make it look good. Just make it work. Doesn't matter if it's the right way. If it looks good, it looks good. And that's just the way it is. You might have to just repaint it and start over. And that's fine. I've definitely done that before. We're almost to the end of the first Harry Potter movie. And I've only completed two of these books. <laughs> so 
It is not a quick little, oh, let me just throw this together project. All right, time to paint our third book, the standard book of spells, grade one. So for this one, I wrote a full name down here. There's no way I'm gonna be able to fit that on there. I wasn't even able to fit, yeah, for fungi. I was able to fit fungi, but I had to cheat on the U and the I herbs did not happen it there were too many curves so it became magical herb and fungi which i think still works i feel like herb can be the plural of herb you know look at the herb garden see it works right of course right okay <laughs> you really focus So I'm watching Harry Potter, Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. I've seen it about a million times. It just struck me how idiotic it is that they send Harry Potter, Harry Potter into the Forbidden Forest for his detention. This kid, I mean, literally every teacher there knows that there is a chance that they're, you know, they're protecting the Sorcerer's Stone. Everybody knows it because everybody has helped to protect the Sorcerer's Stone. They know it's a dangerous time. And they're like, oh, let's send this like MVP of the school, literally the most important person to protect, very famous, Harry Potter. Let's just send him into the dark forest where literally anything could happen to him. Like what teacher approved this message? I can't imagine Professor McGonagall, or Maggie Smith for that matter, allowing sweet summer child Harry Potter, clueless boy that would truly die without Hermione's help. Hermione's my girl. I cannot imagine them allowing Harry to go into the Forbidden Forest under any circumstances, let alone in the middle of the night let alone with Rubius Hagrid, who is, we know, a person who frequently gets drunk and runs his mouth in pubs. Bless his heart, truly bless his heart. Hagrid's my favorite character, so. It is definitely crooked. <laughs> it's okay, it's a spell book, you know, like they don't have printing presses. Welcome to my brain where I obsess over things like this. Okay, I'm gonna turn Harry Potter back on because it's good for me to be able to like zone out a little bit and not get too tense because before I know it, I'm painting like this and I'm like, why do I hurt? Why does everything hurt? <laughs> so I need a wusa and Harry Potter helps me to do that. So that's what I'm gonna do. That locks in the wizarding world exist, like stronger locks than can be opened with Alohomora. They know that this is super dangerous. Why do they only have a spell that they teach first years? Ah, uh, three books down. No, Ron, no. What is it? He's going to sacrifice himself. No, you can't. That must be another way. What is it? What do you see? Shaking hands with Dumbledore. I've won the house cup. And now I get to paint a very tiny, small, itty bitty little white mouse, which in hindsight was extremely ambitious of me. Here goes nothing. I don't know if you can tell that this is a mouse. Okay, so I've decided that I'm going to repaint over this and just start from scratch because I really am not happy with how this is turning out. I was thinking about it and not every book on the spine has to have the name. I'm trying to paint the mouse to the teacup because in Transfiguration, or at least in the book, they mention transfiguring mice into teacups during your first year. And so if I just had an illustration of a mouse being turned into a teacup and then when I had 
when I do the cover, I'll put on a beginner's guide to transfiguration. I just, there's no way to fit this and it look good. Like it just looks jumbled, especially in comparison to these ones, which look really clean and bright. And also this one has a big illustration on it. So I think it'll be nice to have two that have illustrations. So yeah, I'm just gonna paint over this and start again. What do you do? So I'm at that point in the project where I just wanna quit. <laughs> it's a total like ADD response. It's fun and it holds my interest for like a couple hours, but now I'm like so close to the end. And so it makes me wanna just finish at a different time. But you, we must not, we, mu we must not give in to that because that's how we have 50 unfinished projects laying around. So we have to fight it. I put a second coat on the, um, on the binding of the blue book and then I'll do a distressed coat in a little bit, but I am gonna go ahead and paint the brown book, which will be a pretty easy one. It's just a history of magic by Bethilda Bagshot. And I think I already know exactly how I'm gonna do this. So it should be pretty straightforward. Well, so far this is not even close to a straight line. And now I've gotten some on the cover. This is going swimmingly. I already don't like this. Washing it off. Man, I was on a roll. Those first three books, I was like churning them out. And now for these last two, I just can't get them right. Hmm. Something else that didn't really work. I was trying to do red and then put the gold over top of it so that it would give it kind of like a two dimensional type look. It, you can't really see it on the brown. with how these little dudes turned out. I'm also really happy that I don't have to paint them anymore. This project earns a catastrophe rating of 42 since they were a total pain in the butt. I couldn't find anything, but they look magical and they fit in with the rest of my uh, eclectic decor. my friends. Thanks for tagging along on this project. I hope that you enjoyed it and I hope that you feel inspired to go make some sort of spooky craft. Look at things that you would usually throw away and figure out ways that you can make awesome little decor pieces for your home. Definitely keep checking back. I love making holiday crafts and Halloween is easily my favorite holiday of the year. So see you soon and until then. Stay spooky. Oh yeah, and make sure you like and subscribe so you don't miss anything. Come here, come here, come here. I promise this dog loves me. <laughs> and I was like, don't you know that everything's based in herb, herb, herbology? Herbology? Herbalism? That's what I was looking for. Herbalism. We'll find out. Off to a great start. And the annual million times watching of Nightmare Christmas begins. That was complete gibberish, but I hope you got the gist. These are my bats. Because I like that spooky stuff.